When you came back to Ohio, um, you first applied for the chief's position. I did. It's clear the mayor had higher expectations for you then. Did you as well? I didn't realize that there was another opportunity uh, because nothing was on the table at the time that I applied for chief, which as we all know was in the spring. And when I applied, I was, was very serious about the chief's job. I, I read the matrix report, which was 300 pages. I knew what it said. Um, I was very familiar with a lot of the issues that were going on in Columbus, uh, including the officer-involved shootings, uh, the crime that was happening, the homicides that were happening. So I felt like I was positioning myself for that job. Tell our viewers why you decided then that this bigger role, much larger with all of public safety, was something that you wanted to take on. Because my whole career, my whole law enforcement career has been about leadership and creation. As I look back when I was a Youngstown police officer and helping to create the gang program back in the early 90s uh, in the FBI, the opportunities that I had to create a homicide initiative, a community impact initiative, even internationally when I worked in Central America to help uh, the countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala uh, establish digital fingerprinting um, and a bilateral investigation unit between those countries and the FBI. So this was an opportunity, clearly understanding what was happening here in Columbus, to bring all of those skills yeah. and resources and know-how and successes and even some of those failures to the city of Columbus and see how I could join an amazing new team to really bring the health, healing, and restoration that Columbus uh, so demanded and so deserves. You emphasize a new team and that truly is something that Mayor Ginther made very clear to the citizens, some of them not wanting the change, mm -hmm. police officers not wanting the change, but that newness is what excites you. It is. There's probably no profession on the planet that is resistant to change like law enforcement. You know, one of the things that I say is that if you ever talk to someone in law enforcement and you ask them, why do you do what you do? And if they tell you that we do it that way because we've always done it that way, that is the first level of failure. Mm -hmm. Never having the opportunity to assess why we're doing the things that we're doing, not just in the statistical measurements, but in the impact that we're having is absolutely critical as we move forward in 2021 policing. And we understand that the evolution of policing has to be very organic, but along with that, the change has to be organic, the leadership has to be organic, and the community engagements have to be organic. Mm -hmm. No longer can we sit around in meetings and talk about what the problems are, and then we all go away and put the binders away, put the folders away. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I say about conferences. When you go to conferences, they give you this beautiful binder, but if you take it back to your office or home and put it on the shelf and never open it up again, you haven't really learned anything. So it has to be organic. There has to be an engagement. There has to be an understanding. There has to be transparency and trust and all those things that will allow us to be successful in really bringing a new age of policing. And you certainly touched on a lot of the issues that Columbus has faced in the last year and a half or two years, probably even longer. They say the first few months on a job is the honeymoon period. This is no honeymoon. <laughs> I'm not you. exactly sure when the honeymoon <laughs> started or ended. Um, you don't even have it. No, it was a race day one. It really is. So how are you going to address when you have a firestorm that includes a record homicide year, the worst trust that we have seen between public and policing, and also a police force that honestly doesn't feel appreciated? Sure. One of the things that I've said consistently since I've gotten here in the last five weeks is that we have to be innovative in finding new ways to do old things. We recognize that the profession of policing is about protecting and serving. We've all heard that for years. But I challenge us to think about that just a little bit differently in serving and protecting. Certainly our, our women and men of the Division of Police and the Division of Fire are very committed every day and we have women and men out there who are doing the job that we ask them to do, the very difficult job that we ask them to do. Now with new leadership, with Chief Bryant, certainly Chief Happ and myself, we now have a dynamic team. We have a dynamic opportunity to actively and proactively engage our personnel and lead from the front, mm -hmm. be out in the substations, be out in the fire stations, and be there with them in the work that we ask them to do. Yeah. And this is evidenced by all the work that Chief Bryant and Assistant Chief Potts have done before I got here. And I'm just joining the team. I'm finding my space and place to fit in and where I can lend my leadership and the work of the Division of uh, Public Safety 
to really understand how we can engage with our personnel, encourage our personnel, motivate our personnel, and most importantly, model for them what we want to see in the community, the active engagement in the community, the listening, the reestablishing trust, the reestablishing of very transparent and equitable delivery of services across the Department of Public Safety. So we've changed leadership, new ideas, but there are some critics and people in the community who have said, I've heard this. I have heard that we've got new ideas, new, all these new programs that the city and the mayor have laid out, GVI and all this money going towards these programs. Sure. And they say it hasn't worked before. What's going to make it work now? Well, here's what I, I suggest. There's a stack of applications in civil service, uh, and we're certainly encouraging those who want to be a part of the solutions to come and join the team. We're making room on the team, <laughs> um, and I would encourage them to be a part of the process. But everyone is not set out to serve or be police officers or be mm -hmm. firefighters. But here's what I would also encourage. We need community engagement. Anytime I go to a meeting, as I have in the last four or five weeks that I've been here, I've said two things. One is I know what I am going to do come Monday morning after this meeting. I need to know what you are going to do. There's a place on the team for you. We cannot arrest our way out of the problems mm -hmm. that we have. This has not happened in the, in the 2000s. It didn't happen in the 90s. And, and former uh, police commissioner Bill Bratton said it the best. We will never arrest our way out of the problem. And we have not been able to thus mm -hmm. far. And we never will. And we recognize that. We can't incarcerate enough individuals. Right. We understand that. And we have to figure out, as I said, new ways to do old things. And that's going to be community engagement, community involvement, and innovative programming that we are all responsible for. The chief and myself are responsible for now retooling, uh, if you will, the neighborhood safety strategies, which we're in the process of doing. And that will include not only policing services and new innovative uh, strategies and, and techniques for delivering policing services, but it'll also include innovative community engagement and community policing and programs that allow us to position ourselves as leaders and the women and men of public safety to understand what are the needs in each individual community and how can we partner together to address many of the issues that we're facing, including the homicides. When I worked in Salt Lake City, the COPS program was huge. It was great with community policing, kids together. It was. It does net it, results. It when I was yeah. in Los Angeles and developed the community impact program with the Los Angeles Police Department, we saw that that engagement worked. Now, did we move away from arresting individuals that needed to be arrested? Uh, clearly we did not. And there was one community in particular, Lower Baldwin Village it's called, or affectionately known as the Jungle. Mm -hmm. This is the area in Los Angeles where Denzel Washington filmed Training Day. We actually went into that particular area with a specified investigation and remove gang members from that community, but then we went back into that community with a host of community organizations, faith-based organizations, where we picked up trash, painted over graffiti, uh, fixed up the housing, and did things to beautify the area, and we did that with the community. Mm -hmm. And once they were able to reestablish that the community belonged to them, kids went back to the community centers, they played in the playgrounds, gangs no longer controlled those areas, and we were able to not just reduce crime in that particular community, but businesses started to come, which offered jobs and opportunities and allow that community to look like many of the other affluent communities around Los Angeles with cafes and coffee shops and condos and businesses that were thriving. It empowered people to it invest. Did. It sounds like a lot like what GVI is trying to do right now, the group violence intervention program, right, that came out of John Jay College in New York. Sure. Where you're going in, you're identifying the half of 1% of people that are involved in these, whether they're the victims or the perpetrators, taking them out and giving them that resource to find another way. Sure. Is GVI a solution? It will be a part of the solution. Everything that we can talk about is just a part of the puzzle. GVI will be a part of that puzzle. It will create opportunities and spaces and places for not only police, but a lot of other social services mm -hmm. and a lot of faith-based organizations to actively engage with our young people. We recognize the frustration. We recognize the um, impact of the pandemic that we're still under right now. And there's a lot of frustration, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, and, and it's about mediating all of that. 
in creating de-escalation points and de-escalation opportunities mm -hmm. so that we can reduce the violence in our community. Because you lived it. I mean, if I were to take you out of this office, put you in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt instead of a suit, I mean, you lived what you're talking about. I absolutely did. Um, growing up on the south side of Youngstown, spending several years in foster care, uh, being the son of a murdered father, January 15, 1980 at 9.15 p.m. is a day I'll never forget when I was notified that my father had been shot and killed. And I closed the door on my childhood that night at 13 years old, but I didn't understand like what my life would be. But my life has become a crusade, if you will, of pursuing justice for others, for those that have fallen silent, those that believe their voice don't matter anymore, and I created an initiative. When I had the opportunity, I wanted to do something about it, not just serving in law enforcement, but, but creating an opportunity that allowed me to direct effort and resources and personnel to bringing that healing for victim families. And that would be an operation Save Our Streets in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. In 2010, I partnered with the Los Angeles Police Department, and we created a task force that went back and reinvestigated cold case homicides. And over the course of the next six years, we solved over 650 of those cases. And every single time that I had the opportunity to meet with victim families, and it didn't matter if the victims were gang members or drug dealers or whoever they were, we solved those cases because those victims belonged to someone and were loved by someone. But every time I had an opportunity to engage with those families and talk to them and tell them that their case was cleared, the person that was responsible for their loved one's murder was caught was cathartic healing for myself because the you person who killed my father was never held accountable. But you knew who it was. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, I, I knew. Um, my father was not on the right side of the law in Youngstown, Ohio, operating a nightclub there, um, working very closely with Italian organized crime in Youngstown and got in the middle of a, of a situation that did not go his way and he lost his life. Mm -hmm. And he left me as a 13 year old without a father. So what do you say, Director, um, as a son of a murder victim and as a father of two beautiful young women, um, what do you want to say to people out there who are doing the killings? I would want to tell them that they are not only robbing a family of engagement, of memories, of chairs that are filled during the holidays, we're coming into the holiday season. I can't tell you how many times I sat around the table with empty chairs, that you are stealing that away from family. But you're also stealing away from the opportunity for you to substantively engage in holidays and be present with your family. Because we in law enforcement, particularly here in Columbus, within the division of police, we are going to pursue those who commit these atrocities against our community. So there will be no rest, there will be no hiding. We will be creating and are in the process of creating innovative ways, innovative task forces, and innovative approaches to holding those individuals accountable. And we intend to pursue the full measure of justice, not just so that we can send someone to prison, but so that we can bring closure and healing process for those victim families, because that's what's important because I understand what it feels like to live without it. Why do you think Columbus has a higher homicide rate this year than other cities of our same size and even larger cities? We're outpacing them sometimes by double numbers. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I'm in the process of uh, analyzing that. Having served um, in many cities across this country, including Chicago, including Los Angeles, including Washington, D.C., what we're seeing in Columbus, unfortunately, is not that much different than what we're seeing across the country. And we could say a variety of things, social unrest, the pandemic, um, economic downturns, lack of jobs. We, we could blame a lot of sociological concepts. But we know historically that crime, whatever it is, from homicides on, is a manifestation of many other social ills. This is why it's important for us to partner with a variety of organizations, public health organizations, mental health organizations, uh, educational organizations, tutoring, mentoring organizations, to really bring some of that mediation and solution to our communities. Because it's not just a matter of us policing our way out of those situations, it's about how we are addressing those core social ills that manifest into the crimes that we see every day. May not be one answer either. No, there's, yeah. there's not one answer. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm telling you right now, 
that there is not one answer, okay. but it is a unified approach that will have a tremendous impact on our ability to mitigate a lot of the crime and violence that we see in our communities. But we've got to be committed to that. All of us collectively have got to be committed to that because, again, those social ills are not new. Sure. They've been around forever, and the manifestations look very differently. And one of the things that is different today than it was when I first started is the advent of social media, mm. the impact of social media, the immediacy of information sharing and information collecting and individuals that want to be on Instagram and Snapchat and all those other Powerful. things that are out there. That whole technological aspect is a true impact on our ability to police both mm -hmm. positively and negatively. I want to get in a few more questions because I know we have a hard out, I think, about uh, we've got another 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Um, so you're coming in new to the city, and no offense, a lot of people are like, Director Who, right? <laughs> so tell us, describe yourself in a word or two that you want people to know who is Director Robert Clark. I am someone who is authentic, um, extremely competent in the field of law enforcement and criminal justice, but not just in terms of policing, but in community service. Having lived in those communities that I've described here, um, I understand the mistrust between the community and law enforcement, um, not wanting to be actively engaged. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation just this week about a young man who said that we don't want to talk to the police and we don't want the police to talk to us. And I asked him to just change a couple words. We don't want to talk to you. We want to speak with you. And that's a very different methodology. It's a very different mindset. This is not me speaking to you. This is about us creating a bilateral process of communication, and I am forward-leaning when it comes to that. I don't mind being in the communities, having the hard conversations, the challenging questions, holding us accountable for, the, for doing the right things, mm -hmm. because my philosophy is, and my true north is, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. And I'm so honored to be partnered now with the chief of police and an assistant chief of police and a fire chief who are committed to doing the right things. Now, can we do all things? No. But we can create partnerships that will allow us to do that. And that was one of the things that I was very proud of in Los Angeles, is that I recognized that many of the things that I did out there did not belong to the FBI. Right. I created them for the FBI with a host of upwards of 180 different social organizations and faith-based organizations to partner with me to bring the impact in our communities we wanted to see. So for me, it's someone who has lived it, who has tremendous authenticity, who knows what I'm talking about on both sides of the fence, mm -hmm. and realizing the value of partnerships. And that's what we're seeking right now, are people who will partner with us. Mm -hmm. What's your timeline? Did you give yourself a benchmark to say, we put these programs into place, I wanna see action or difference in these numbers by X date? Well, we are in the process of identifying those things that we can do short term, those things that will take us a little bit longer to do, medium term, and then those longer term things. As a matter of fact, when we are constructing the new neighborhood safety strategy, I've actually put it from 2021 to 2023 because I believe that we have to put some things on there that we stretch for, that we grow for, that we may not be able to do in this year's budget cycle or maybe even next year's budget cycle but at least they're on the table and we're building a process towards that. Mm -hmm. That was the way that I created the Virtual Homicide Library in Los Angeles, which is the only one in existence in the country. That's the way we created a fingerprint uh, database in Central America. That was the way we introduced the human trafficking workbook program to Trinidad and Tobago, because I believe in the stretch, the organic, uh, creating an organic growth process mm -hmm. so that we are constantly every day pushing ourselves. So the chief and I, we're in the process of identifying those things we can do immediately. Certainly we can do mid-range and those longer term things that will just take us a little bit of time to get to just because of the enormity of it. What makes you tick? What makes you mad? Uh, yep, um, not being responsive to the opportunity that we have before us to bring the change that we wanna see. As I shared last night, this is a historic moment in the city of Columbus. We don't, may, may not recognize that today and it's kind of the same old, same old, but for individuals not to recognize that this is a historic moment, mm -hmm. this is a unique opportunity for us to bring the change we want to see. 
Now, I don't have to tell you as a reporter, you have seen and witnessed, probably from the front lines, the social unrest that has happened across our country in just the last couple of years. But here was the disadvantage for me. I got to witness that from my couch. And for someone who wants to be actively engaged, someone who wants to partner with women and men who want to be the difference makers in our community, was very frustrating for me. Because you weren't here in the States. You were down. No, I'd already come home because of COVID. In November of 2020, right? I was already yeah. home. Yeah. So as I watched all of that unfold on my television screen, I just so desperately wanted yeah. to be back in the game. I desperately wanted to be uh, back in the profession to bring the things that I had already created in Los Angeles. And I felt like I had some answers to some of the mm -hmm. things that I was seeing. So the thing that makes me tick, or as you say, makes me angry, <laughs> are individuals who do not recognize that they have a tremendous opportunity to have tremendous positive impact on our community. And when our women and men put on their uniform every day, that's their opportunity. Like you said, there are open applications. Anyone can apply. We have a stack of applications. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they're uh, digital now, so you don't even need a piece of paper. It's <laughs> just a, a text now. That's how you, those kids do it now. And you right? can get right in the game. Just a couple more questions. Um, I do want to switch gears. You know, I know we talked a lot about crime, but I want to talk about COVID. Certainly the big question right now, vaccinations, mandates, all that. And, sure. and the mayor has not um, instituted a, a city mandate for employees. Cincinnati has. Many hospitals have done it. Columbus is offering an, an incentive, right, to have people get vaccinated, but the unions have to sign on board. So sure. from your standpoint, though, I mean, you've got fire and police on the front lines. They're first responders. We've unfortunately saw two firefighters pass away related to COVID. Right. Your thoughts? We watch the numbers. So weekly, we are having conversations about the numbers. And here's where there has to be a commitment in leadership to the science and what we're dealing with the work that's being done by the CDC, the FDA, and all of the other work that's being done out there. Right now, the numbers are telling us that we do have some very, very slight reductions, but we recognize that education is the key. Educating our personnel who are actively engaged in the process and even us incentivizing the process. We have watched, obviously, what has happened across the country with mandating vaccines. And again, I, I believe that we're in a position to allow our employees to make rational, educated, responsible decisions. Mm -hmm. Clearly with the firefighters that we've lost since I've been here, and I've attended both funerals, and, and it's very powerful to see when our personnel assemble and honor those that we've lost. But there's, there's also a responsibility piece, maybe in that lesson that we learn collectively in public safety, I need to be vaccinated, I need to be safe, and I need to further this conversation of education and science around the vaccinations. I recognize everyone has a personal choice, but it's not just a personal choice, but it's a familial choice too. We as first responders out on the front lines every day are subjecting our families to this pandemic and to this virus if we do not take the responsibility to protect them. So before, in my opinion, just Robert 101, before we can protect those on the front line, I've got to protect my home, which means protecting myself. And that's also part of the dialogue and part of the educational process as well. Final question on your Facebook, because we always trust everything on Facebook. <laughs> of course. You have a quote. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. What's your gift? Service. Um, I am all about service. Muhammad Ali has said, that your service is the rent that you pay to be here on this earth. Um, I am a servant of God, a man of faith. I believe that God has equipped me with certain talents, but more importantly, experiences. The experiences that I've had, the good and the bad, losing my father when I was 13, losing my mother to cancer at 60, um, losing all of the things that have happened to me in my life, living in foster care, the feeling of abandonment, being made to feel like I couldn't learn, um, then rising to become the uh, graduate student of the, of the year in the state of Ohio in 1995. So these are opportunities and experiences that have made me who I am. So I always share with people, what you see is what you get. What I say is what I mean. And I am a servant. Uh, I have been commissioned uh, as a servant. 
uh, who reads the Bible, who believes in the Word of God, and wants to lead in a very powerful way, but an authentic way and an inclusive way, because I recognize that I can't do it alone, and I need all of Columbus to support me, um, be there to do the work, because ultimately the work has got to get done, right. and ultimately what we all want to see is a better Columbus, and, and we're going to need all of us to do that. And not many people can say they have God's thumbprint in their office. I saw that. You noticed that, did you? I sure did. Yeah, that, that was actually a gift, and as you can see, it's, it's one of the only things that I have, I have brought to my office because I believe that God has his thumbprints on my life and on this opportunity for me to serve in this position, and I don't take that lightly. I don't take the partnerships lightly. I don't take the responsibilities lightly, and even the burdens I don't take lightly. So every time I get a report of a shooting, a homicide, or things happening around the city, I know that that impacts. It keeps you up at night. It, it does, it does, because I want to do something to resolve that, and I know that I can't do it alone. So I have a fantastic team of people who work very hard. Um, as I say, I, I work for them, so they, I work very hard for them, yeah. and they're out there doing the things that need to be done, but I want to encourage them and motivate them and let them know that we hear you, we have your back, do the right thing, and here's one of the things that I just said to an officer yesterday as I swore him in. One officer who was injured and came back for some training, and I said, here's my advice to you. Remember your oath. If you just remember your oath for your career and what you swore to uphold, what you swore to protect, and what you swore to provide, you will never lose your true north.